He's going to be talking about threat modeling this morning. There you go. I heard a Wilhelm scream. God damn it. You're never getting away from that. Frankly, I'm, away. I'm amazed you people are awake. Holy crap. All right. Lies. Where's Arco? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is where I say that you're allowed to come and punch me while I'm on stage. <laughs> this is fun times. Yeah. Uh, right. So um, practical threat modeling. Right. So this talk is effectively I'm stepping on the projector. Um, this talk about is about being prepared in some cases from uh, unforeseen consequences and how to grapple with bizarre and unexpected stuff, uh, given especially this year's trajectory in the news cycle. Um, my name is Dan Tetler. Uh, I run a small computer security company called Phobos Group. Uh, I'm a security researcher, an aspiring Bond villain, and I simulate espionage for living. living. Um, if you didn't see what I was doing before I turned the talk on, I should probably be in your threat model. Uh, I routinely post hacks, bypasses, tips, tricks, uh, all sorts of random stuff to the internet. I actively participate in development of attack tools. Uh, in some cases, I write very, very poor Python to help facilitate some of those attack tools. I uh, show other people how to attack, how to attack stuff, and um, my company may hire, may be hired by your company to defend from me. No. Sorry, it's early. <laughs> that being said, um, many people, uh, including myself, have this sort of approach to the internet at large, uh, and when conducting themselves on the internet, um, it's in a lot of cases completely trivial to gain access to systems just because they're made. Oops, they're made completely public. Um, and in a lot of cases, they're made pub public via a multitude of different types of technologies. So oftentimes, when we, when we gain access to a system, it's because the system was overlooked and for some reason remains publicly accessible. Um, hey, look, shells. Uh, is it too dark? No. Um, it might be a little too bright for this. So that being said, this is effectively the internet. Uh, can you tell what's going on there? You can barely tell what's going on there. So it's a, a collection of half fixes. Uh, patchwork, security through obscurity, uh, and the only reason it works is because people haven't noticed yet, uh, or they just don't care. So uh, that in of itself is sort of a staggering thought since it's been around for so long and apparently still works, uh, except for when, you know, cameras denial of service the entire internet or Turkey decides they want to block YouTube and the entire internet breaks for a day. So uh, you may encounter unforeseen consequences. <laughs> you may buy a security appliance to realize that it's easily bypassed or easily exploited or allows attackers to gain full access to your corporate network. Uh, you may believe that a technology that you have implemented is solid only to realize that it is not applicable to the thing that's attacking you, uh, and it is highly likely the solution to a security gap that you've identified is realistically insufficient and just a feel-good solution that makes you feel better but doesn't actually have any tangible purpose. Uh, I discovered this Twitter account a few days ago, and I think it's really awesome. Uh, it's difficult to read on this projector, so I'll try and read you a couple of these, a couple of these uh, tweets. Um, it's impossible, obviously, to plan for everything, but you don't really have to. Um, you plan for eventualities that are the most likely given your environment and your configuration. So it, it means taking the time to identify what it is that you're doing and why people would attack you based on what you're doing. So this is a great, uh, this is a great sort of springboard for that. Like the first, the first tweet reads, a legal intern in the company has responded to a forged search warrant and has delivered user data to an unknown party. Imagine being the person doing incident response for that. Oof, there's not enough alcohol in the world, right? Like, um, law enforcement has emailed someone in your company. They're asking how to serve a search warrant. Oh, that's not that scary. Um, yeah, this is a good one. Malware has been discovered in the wild, signed by a certificate of yours. Not enough booze on the, yeah, it's ridiculous, <laughs> right? Oh my God, I don't want to get that phone call. Um, however, uh, conversely, this can also be somewhat of a rabbit hole. Um, if left unchecked, a runaway train of thought could easily lead to some very tinfoil hatty type things. This is a great example. It's actually a fucking tinfoil hat you can buy on Kickstarter. It's like a beanie with, an, with a uh, Faraday cage in it. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like the tinfoil hat V2. Um, if you believe that electromagnetic signals targeted at your head are in your threat model, there's actually a thing for that. Um, so, <laughs> maybe you should you should go and watch their video. Go, go and find this video. Like, go look these guys up, Shield on Kickstarter, and watch their video and try not to cringe. Um, so, 
everybody actually does threat modeling to some degree. In a lot of cases, they either aren't aware that there's a term for it or aren't aware that they're actually doing it. Um, there's several large organizations that will tell you that threat modeling is a huge process that involves graphs and charts and acronyms and homework. And like Microsoft even has a card game like Magic the Gathering style to try and help train you on how to do threat modeling. And it's like, no, that's all BS. It's, it's there. Um, they've done that for revenue generation purposes so that they can sell you training. Like, I'm telling you this is all basically common sense. Um, like headlines like this are basically daily. Like this is ridiculous. It's only May. This is staggering. This is like three months of headlines and this is just what I was able to find in 15 minutes. Like really? Um, these headlines are written in a way that indicates that they're supposed to be actionable, but usually they're the furthest thing from actionable. These are usually um, headlines that are written specifically so that you continue reading or you spend more time on the site because they get ad revenue when you do that. So that being the case, this is a scan that I conducted uh, about three and a half weeks ago where I was scanning the whole internet for port 445 and I found four and a half million hosts that were listening on 445. That doesn't necessarily mean all of them are actually doing anything interesting on 445 or that it's SMB, but uh, of those um, machines scanned, 1.7 million were vulnerable to MS 1710. Like, that number hasn't changed in three weeks very much. I think it's down to like 1.4. But like, anybody want 1.4 million shells? Because like, you go to Google and you like script kitty download the NSA double pulsar tools and then you point them at those hosts and you have shells. That's it. There's no challenge. It's not like you have to dev anything. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, there was 175,000 infected with double pulsar at the time, or 165,000 when I did this scan. I think the next day it went up to 175,000. Um, and in a lot of cases, these Windows computers that are publicly exposed and have 445 open that are vulnerable to all sorts of stuff bridge to a LAN where the machines that are on that LAN are not very much different from the one that's public and exposed and, and vulnerable. So I couldn't find the original presenter for this quote that I'm prepared, that I've prepared for you guys, but I found the worst possible hacker stock photo that I could to attribute it to somebody because the quote isn't mine and I can't remember where I got it. Um, so hopefully whoever they are will say hello in the future. Uh, these are actually fairly important talking points and they're it's some of the, the meat of the talk, so uh, I wanted to point that out. So the vast majority of problems are logical in nature and not memory corruption or zero days. There are many logical problems in complex software and infrastructure. They are just as exploitable, if not more reliable than O'Day, and your static analysis tool will never find the bugs that Stuxnet used. So. Um, that being said, one of my huge pet peeves is when uh, presenters um, read the slide deck to the audience. So you're welcome. <laughs> um, so TLDR, just be realistic, you should do fine. Uh, the point of all of this is that it's mostly common sense and it should be pretty straightforward. And just like your Cal Lee desktop says, the quieter you become, the more you can hear. That's actual real advice. Uh, it actually works. And the scientific method works really, really well for this, this type of thing. So having the right attitude can basically make or break your security. Um, Saying things publicly like, I'm not interesting, I'm not important, I don't have any interesting data, nobody would target me, I'm boring, uh, I don't have anything to hide, I don't have anything of value. What you're telling people is, you don't care about your own defensive capabilities, you presume that you're already owned, it means that people can do evil things to you and either you won't investigate or won't care and this invites attackers to come get you. So, for one, never ever let your PR or marketing department say that something is hack-proof or unhackable. It's just a bad idea. It, it becomes an open invite for everybody that wants to challenge the statement. So this guy, the Gruck, did a talk at We Are Troopers uh, like a month and a half ago, and he covered some parts of this material uh, and where he described how people classically deal with kinetic-based threats. Um, and he described these three points, which are cap do they have the capability, do they have the opportunity, and do they have the intent? So capability today on the internet is can I download a tool from the internet and watch a YouTube video that explains how to use the tool? Um, opportunity is, can I talk to my target over the internet? And intent is, a, a, the, intent is the tough one. And at this point today, when we're dealing with, you can just Google up NSA payloads and point them at whoever, um, the capability and the opportunity are pretty much covered and now it's down to just intent and trying to operate like threat modeling from just purely intent, it gets kind of tricky. So uh, you have to decide at a high level what you think your threats are based on what your business is and what you're actually doing. So, you know, do you have to deal with generic internet noise, or I call it the security waterline? You know, uh, today, if you were to take a Windows 7 or Windows XP box and plug it into the internet directly with no firewall, you're looking at getting double pulsar in about 30 seconds. No, yeah, about 30 seconds. 
between 30 seconds and like I think a minute and a half or something ridiculous. Um, a bunch of people are getting different results, but at this point, uh, you can presume that MS1710 is going to act like Sasser and Configure and all the other stuff that's perpetually on the internet forever. Um, you know, are you are you susceptible to that sort of thing? Do you, are you forced to put those types of machines directly on the internet? Um, are you are you dealing with you know children that have access to NSA level tools? Uh, are you dealing with actual talented attackers or black hats or gray hats or uh, other folks with malicious intent that have access to these tools? Uh, do you have to deal with targeted attacks? Like, did somebody say that you were, did your you know did somebody in your PR, PR department say that you were unhackable? Um, did Tavis Orman they notice you? <laughs> Um, <laughs> right, uh, third party vendors, you know, do you have contractors with physical access? Did you hire Target's HVAC company? That sort of thing. Like, what, what are you dealing with and how scary is it? Like, so having some idea at a high level of like what it is you're dealing with is really, really helpful. Um, so oftentimes you'll hear from vendors that try and sell you threat intelligence feed for like tens of thousands of dollars a month um, that uh, the threat intelligence feed that you're getting is really just a bunch of IP addresses. In a lot of cases, and there's no attribution to what those things are or why they exist or why they're threats, they just give you this list of IP addresses and say, stick these in your firewall, and that's it. And you're paying them, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month for this. Um, if you like to invest in threat in intelligence and you want to work that data set into your threat modeling, uh, it's a good idea to focus on what is simple and actionable. Uh, just blocking IP addresses will te telegraph that to your attackers. Like if you have attackers and um, their IP addresses have end up, ended up in your threat intelligence feeds or whatever, um, and then they, they notice that you're being blocked. They're being blocked at the firewall. They just come from different IP addresses, right? So it's really easy to get around just straight IP blocking. Uh, it's a better idea, uh, especially if you're, if you're paying for this stuff, you're paying this kind of money for this stuff, that you should pay for uh, services that actually will tell you about threat actors and threat groups and why it is that they're after your company and not just give you a list of IP addresses. So that real threat intelligence actually focuses on people and it focuses on those three talking points that I described earlier, um, capability, intent, and opportunity. So with that being said, I'd like to go over a few examples uh, at a very high level of threat modeling just to sort of articulate that workflow that I'm trying to describe and how this makes pretty quick work of the decision making process when dealing with new threats. So at first, we'll go over personal and home networks, right? Fairly straightforward. Um, what are your actual threats to so like home networking and consumer grade stuff? You have like visitors, you have like your kids, you have your kids' friends, you have crappy consumer equipment that's poorly written or broken out of the box. You have, you know, machines that you're, you know, equipment you can't patch or uh, the patches don't come frequently enough or the vendor will complain and say that like some bug isn't going to get patched and they'll never get fixed. You have software that's out of date, you know, uh, the typical stuff that you see, like if you're in the, if you're in the same boat that I, I assume many of us are, you're, you're the family tech support person, um, that basically. Right? So based on those threats, what are the actual risks? Well, the risks are you can have stolen identity, which is probably one of the scarier ones. Um, you can get infected with malware or spyware. You know, somebody can compromise your Google, your Gmail account and spam a bunch of your contacts and try and spread malware that way. Your computer becomes slow. The internet becomes unreliable. Most of the time it's just annoying and there's not like a whole bunch of risk because that surface has been articulated by so many different people, by so many different vendors. There's not a whole lot left people can do other than just annoy you. Uh, your typical home network generally is a single attack surface plane. It's not very complex and attacks that do come that are targeted will be easily defeated with basic security hygiene. Um, targeted attacks tend to precipitate because of personal grudges or internet, internet arguments um, and recovery can range from like a small nuisance to formatting a Windows box and installing uh, on maybe one or a small number of machines. So defensive measures, simple stuff, right? Change default credentials, patch, upgrade, harden your wireless network, make sure it's not public. Um, ask a lot of questions, try and be informed, you know, if, if you're not a super technical person or if this is your, your um, the corpus of what it is that you do in terms of securing environments, then uh, spend a lot of time, you know, talking to people, asking questions, go read things on the internet, and you'll, you'll do pretty well. Uh, so next is mobile devices. With mobile devices, um, your threats tend to be things like malicious applications. That's a fairly big one. Um, rogue wireless access points. Talk to me about the um, hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, stingrays, other radio type attacks, SDR related stuff. You can you can do things like spoofing um, GSM and using OpenBST and things like that. SS7 attacks, which are colorful and interesting, which is. One of the reasons that people say SMS two-factor authentication is dead and you shouldn't use it. Um, leaked tools, for example, anybody, anybody remember Hacking Team? Um, Hacking Team got hacked a couple of years ago and their 
whole thing was writing payloads for Android and iOS platforms, and all of their payloads got leaked. So just like the NSA payloads, if you Google hard enough, you can find the hacking team payloads, and now you have hacks for iOS and Android. Because um, who runs antivirus on their phone? Uh, so as, as far as risks go, um, given those, given those uh, threats, your risks are getting malware installed, right? And that ranges from a whole bunch of different outcomes. Um, you can you can be eavesdropped on. Uh, people can impersonate you. You can be tracked. Uh, you can be blackmailed. There's all that sort of stuff. People can extract data. Um, the the risks here um, fall on a variety of different attack surface planes, right? So I'm just going to cover three because this gets really hairy really quickly because mobile uh, or car carriers rather telecommunication carriers are really complex. So this is a really, 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 really simple version um, of that environment. So one, one attack surface effectively is the connection between your mobile device and a consumer and, or potentially enterprise grade wireless router, right? So your phone talks to the router, that can be man in the middle, you can do evil stuff there. Um, same thing, stingray or radio attacks that can intercept communications between your mobile phone and the tower. That's another attack vector. Um, then you have DNS hijacking, route poisoning, this, the typical TCP type stuff that happens outside of the networking appliance once all the communication from the phone has turned into Ethernet frames. Um, then you have the, the scary stuff, the SS7 attacking, uh, which is effectively, uh, I had to go make sure that I had my head wrapped around this correctly. As far as SS7 goes, like, it is possible with a laptop and a few accounts and, and, and several places to reroute. This is effectively SS7 attacking in my mind is similar to doing like BGP hijacking. You can just tell the SS7 system, hey, you should route that phone call through my asterisk box instead of that one over there. And then suddenly you have full access to all the text messages, full access to all the phone calls. You can record calls. You can, try, you can, you can tell the phone like, oh, this is emergency services. You need to tell me your GPS location. And it will. Um, and things like, uh, things like secure messengers won't, I mean, they won't help you because they can't tell you, they can't tell the system how to route your calls and how to route your, your text messages. I mean, it'll be encrypted and nobody can necessarily hear you directly, but text messages are clear text. So if somebody can get access to your uh, SS7 transit data, then yeah. Uh, to a two-factor authentication for SMS. Like if you're, um, services that use SMS for two-factor authentication are, are potentially vulnerable to this sort of thing. And if targeted, then yeah, it could get really scary. So again, just, just three, there's a lot more. I'll stop here because I only have an hour. Um, so defensive measures for mobile devices. Um, in a corporate environment, use MDM, right? Um, mobile device managers, there's several of these. Uh, they're fairly decent from what I can tell. Uh, don't permit rooting or jailbreaking. I know this is like the antithesis at a hacker con, like you're gonna tell me I can't root my phone? No, just make sure that you know what you're doing. Um, use the real market. Um, there's there's the real markets for both platforms. Uh, there are a whole bunch of secondary markets for both platforms. The secondary markets are a great way to find yourself infected with malware. Um, run antivirus. Yes, there is actually antivirus for both platforms. Uh, it was it's probably a good idea to look into it. Um, if you have money burning a hole in your pocket, there's actually a vendor called Zimperium that will um, turn every phone in your corporate environment into a, an IDS sensor, which makes things really interesting because now you have several hundred or several thousand IDS sensors floating around and going to airports and going to different places, and you also get all, you start getting all sorts of really interesting telemetry out of that. Um, use secure messengers. And I say that with a caveat that there's a whole shtick about that. Um, secure messengers, as I want to make a quick note on, there's been a lot of discussion about secure messengers uh, in the recent news, especially a lot of talk about uh, tools that have end-to-end -end crypto. And um, there's been a lot of wildly different headlines and wildly different opinions about choosing the right one for you, whatever your scenario is. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about that specific thing because it seems like um, a large contingent of the of the media discussing secure messengers can't words. Um, so let's focus on just this component of the of the diagram, right? So let's zoom in here. So if we call this part of the diagram the cryptographically secured data that is being transmitted out of the Wi-Fi radio or out of the mobile radio, and we call this part of the diagram, the actual hardware of the phone, the operating system, or physical access to the phone. Um, if you compromise this, this becomes worthless. Uh, if I watch you write a letter and mail it, 
Uh, I don't need to intercept the letter at the mailbox, at the post office, or at its destination because I watched you write it. I know what's inside of it already. Uh, the same goes for this end-to-end -end crypto stuff. If you key log a phone, if you screenshot a phone, if you record audio on a phone, if you shoulder surf somebody, uh, you no longer need to worry about defeating the crypto because you get what you want before it gets encrypted. So the, the, it's, way, it's way, way, way easier to attack the phone itself than it is to attack the crypto and the math. So nobody's attacking the crypto or the math. They don't have to. It's a lot easier to just fish somebody than it is to try and break a whole bunch of math with supercomputers. So that being said, yeah. So on to corporate workstations. Uh, corporate workstation threats, right? This is like typical blue team stuff, right? Everybody has seen this stuff and has dealt with it in, in some cases. Um, once we get into the complexity of the corporate environment, the possibilities tend to extend at a fairly staggering rate, but I'm going to try and keep it very high level for the sake of the exercise. Uh, remember, these are non-exhaustive non examples. So these are things that your blue team will encounter, um, with the exception of targeted attacks, obviously, which are pretty rare unless you've made somebody angry or told Twitter that you're unhackable. Um, <clears throat> the risks associated with these threats are the typical stuff you see in every report from every vendor, you know, IP theft, data loss, productivity loss, that sort of thing. Um, these are typical incident response engagements. Uh, this is an, ex an example that I found of a corporate network that appears to have some sort of Citrix deployment and a bunch of virtual firewalls because I don't have enough trouble in my life with one firewall, I want four. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so this has got like this whole, and this is new to me too, like apparently you can route in an external cloud provider and have them be like just another segment on your LAN because that's safe. Um, so given enough time, I'm sure that we could go over this uh, with uh, this fictional environment with a microscope and come up with some staggering, ridiculous amount of attack surfaces and what sort of risks they have. Uh, and supposedly, again, Microsoft even has a card game that's supposed to be able to help you with this. But that doesn't really scale. Uh, it's just unmanageable. It doesn't scale. Uh, you can't expect to adequately defend this environment with 200 pages of documentation that you've written about all the attack surface minutia. Uh, your time is better spent finding choke points and spots to gather data uh, than it is on academic paperwork uh, components because some vendor pressured you into it or is charging you for it or something like that. We have to be realistic about these sorts of things. So uh, defensive measures for this sort of thing. Malware has to phone home somewhere, somewhere right? Like, Somebody gets a shell, the shell has to talk over the internet using plain old TCP to wherever the phone home is. Uh, there's not a lot of magic here, or there's effectively no magic here. Uh, even nation state actors have to abide by the rules of the internet. Um, if, if, if I get into your network and I want to exfiltrate data, I have to talk over the network and that means there's a chance I'm going to get caught. Uh, that means that network egress is a choke point and defenders can use this choke point to their advantage. Uh, if you block, for example, outbound port 53 and outbound port 445 at your egress firewall, uh, and you just watch the failed firewall attempts falling down and you log them, you're going to start seeing a lot of really interesting things that you probably aren't going to be happy with, uh, but that you didn't notice were there before. Um, there's absolutely zero reason that any corporate workstation needs to talk on port 445 out to the internet, and there's also zero reason that one workstation in marketing needs to talk to China on port 53. It's just no. Um, policies are great, but unless you enforce them, no good will come of it. Uh, if you catch somebody RDPing into the exchange server so that they can watch porn uh, because it sits in front of WebSense, you should fire that guy. Rules only work if you enforce them. Uh, enterprise devices, uh, and I'm calling, so this is, a, I'm, I'm inventing this term. <laughs> um, so I'm calling, I'm calling, the, the, I'm giving this name to devices that are appliances that are single purpose, but that are categorically not infrastructure like networking equipment. Uh, as in, if they go down, you might have a bad day, but it's not going to kill the business and it's not going to stop work. Uh, unless, you know, it, it's different than if firewalls or switches died. Um, things like MDM appliances, spam appliances, FireEye, conference systems, signage, display systems, that sort of stuff, right? So, um, enterprise device threats, people tend to forget that these are just computers in a fancy case. They're just regular computers. I mean, just because they're called an appliance doesn't mean it's not running embedded Windows XP or embedded Linux, right? Like Linux is Linux, right? Kernel 2.14, as appalling as it is, is still kernel 2.14, despite the fact that it's on flash and not a hard drive. Um, uh, in a lot of cases, vendors manufacture their own boards, which is really cool, like uh, Juniper and Cisco, if you pull the lid off, these things are actually custom boards. Uh, in other cases, on the complete other uh, side of that spectrum, at the extreme is somebody will get a, a really awesome case, and then literally, I shit you not, masking tape a Raspberry Pi to the inside of it, and send, sell it for like ten or $20,000, claiming it's some sort of security appliance. This was actually in the news recently. 
Um, so depending on what it is that you're buying, you could inherit a whole wide variety of risks ranging from one end to the other. And it gets pretty hairy. Um, so in terms of actual risks, uh, again, I mentioned hacking team in the past. Uh, they got hacked, and about a terabyte of their data got leaked, including mail spools, their entire uh, source code repository, all their zero days, their whole tool, the front end, the back end, everything. So uh, the guy that did it uh, called himself Phineas Fisher, and he wrote up a blog post like a year after it happened about how he got in, and what he, what he explained was that he, he was able to gain access to their infrastructure by abusing an appliance. And uh, we know that they were using FireEye, and we know that they were using Barracuda, uh, but he didn't say which appliance it was that he got in with. Um, we know at the time that hacking team was running these, these pieces of equipment because they were publicly accessible, which indicates that uh, their network was something like this, where you have a firewall device that's doing all the firewalling for your corporate environment, but then you have another appliance that is also effectively bridging your corporate network to the internet. And arguably this is the worst possible scenario because in this, in this case, if, you're, if you have this appliance that's running kernel 0.4, who knows, um, that's publicly accessible and becomes vulnerable and gets compromised, then this firewall in this diagram has absolutely no power over stopping the traffic into and out of this appliance. It's, it's not in line, it can't do anything. So arguably this is the worst case scenario and unless you have telemetry wrapped around those sorts of stuff, somebody could be in this in, uh, appliance uh, exfiltrating to their heart's content and you would have no idea. Uh, this configuration is a little bit better. Um, it, 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 it means attackers don't have super easy access to the vulnerable appliance, um, but uh, if anybody remembers the FireEye uh, attack that happened in, or I should say the FireEye vulnerability rather, that happened in, in I think December of 2015, um, effectively the short, the short version of the story was that if you send two email addresses to an organization that, uh, that is using the FireEye appliance, um, you can trigger remote code execution on the FireEye and have it phone a shell home to you. So. Yeah, that. <laughs> um, so if, uh, if you do this right, then in, in this example, using this diagram, uh, you send two emails, they go through the firewall, they sail through just like they're supposed to, uh, they land on the FireEye appliance, the FireEye appliance pops a shell, phones it back home to you. Um, because the appliance is behind the firewall and wants to initiate a connection out to the internet and it's traveling on port 443, let's say, that's, that's permitted because 443 is uh, permitted in your egress rules. You have a shell on a FireEye appliance as root on a LAN somewhere and the firewall has done nothing to prevent it. At that point, it's just a matter of how clever do you want to be to egress or um, exfiltrate data. Uh, this is probably the best scenario and it's also arguably one of the uh, more difficult ones to deal with and configure. Um, you put the appliance outside your firewall and you treat it as an untrusted device because generally these things are black box and you're at the mercy of the vendor. If they don't want to patch or they don't want to update or they don't want to issue updates, um, then you're stuck with this thing. And if you're stuck with it, then you want to make sure that you are not put at risk because you're stuck with this thing. So. Um, Effectively, the defensive measures here are don't blindly trust the vendor. Don't just blindly buy stuff and put it in your environment because it's just a Linux box or it's just a Windows box. Like I bet every, ho every hospital that got ransomware are probably kicking themselves thinking like, oh, this giant $15 million MRI machine, like this was an appliance. Why isn't this thing behaving? Well, it's running XP. That's for one, drink harder, like drink, oh my God. Um, if you treat these things like a computer, it's pretty easy to wrap your head around. Uh, they're basically just Linux boxes in a lot of cases. Uh, include them in your vulnerability management program if you have one. Um, make sure that they stay patched. Keep an eye on who they talk to and what data they transmit. Um, some of these things can be enormously useful. Uh, alternatively, you can also experience something like the FireEye bug from 2015. Uh, so embedded devices, the fun one. Um, various web webcams that run MIPS or ARM platforms can be compromised and used at pivot points, like look at the Mirai botnet. Uh, medical devices that run unpatched version of Windows are dangerously vulnerable. Hospitals put imaging equipment directly on the internet because 445 becomes exposed, it's vulnerable. In some cases, everything from MS08, 067, all the way to MS1710 and everything in between, including WannaCry and all of its variants. Um, machinery using SCADA equipment and PLC gear are trivially exploitable. Power plants, refineries, and other industry, uh, other verticals like industrial or energy are stuck using this gear and they have to grapple with it because in some cases, the, the one example that was given to me in a discussion on Twitter was the $15, MR, uh, 15 million dollar MRI machine that you purchased uh, 10 years ago, the vendor has gone out of business uh, and because, F, because of the FDA, you can't 
you can't just reverse engineer the drivers out of the Windows XP machine that's driving the thing and make an open source version of it because um, that, that stack is no longer certified by the FDA and according to the law, you have to have FDA certification before a product is marketed. So if you were to do this to fix your scenario, to be less vulnerable, you would be in trouble with the FDA, which is a ridiculous thing to consider. Um, so uh, we had a customer this year actually tell us that they have started seeing ransomware for SCADA equipment and PLC devices. So that's, and I, sorry I wasn't able to actually get an example of it, but um, that guy had his hair on fire for a while, sadly. So um, I did a talk in 2012 where I put on a pith helmet and I presented a tour on about embedded systems that I found on the internet and I coined the phrase the uh, Shodan Safari and since then it's picked up a small handful of other people that do the same sort of thing for fun on the Twitters and post silly interesting things that shouldn't be on the internet. Uh, the vast majority of these things tend to have absolutely zero security. If they do have security it's often very trivial to bypass. So embedded uh, devices control lots of things around us and in almost every case they're trivially, trivially exploitable. Uh, and this means that attackers who are aboard or have an agenda can coordinate attacks to do really scary and interesting things. Uh, the most famous of which, which is arguably Stuxnet, which targeted uranium refinement equipment and destroyed centrifuges by spinning them too fast. Uh, medical devices that are plugged into people which fall prey to this could call, cause loss of life. Or on the benign side, some teenager could find your Philips Hue light bulbs in your living room and make it purple for a day. Um, there's a lot of different things that can happen with embedded devices and a lot of different vulnerabilities, so you should know what you're getting into when you plug these things in. Um, or, you know, buy them for what have you. Uh, the devices are typically very fragile in nature and if you end map them, they will fall over or break or cease to respond, in some cases having to be power cycled. Um, a lot of SCADA and PLC equipment runs its own TCP IP stack. Some genius thought it would be a great idea to say, you know, screw the Linux kernel, that seems, that seems too easy, I'm going to write my own TCP IP handler. And then they attach them to natural gas turbines. Um, right? Um, so, uh, you treat them like you would enterprise equipment, like the last category, right? You just don't trust them, you isolate them, you segment them from the network, you tighten down all access to and from them, and you make sure that they're upgraded and patched as far as the vendor possibly makes it, uh, it could make that happen. Uh, it's important to know how fragile they are. It's probably a good idea if you have the uh, bandwidth or the time to actually do like lab-based testing to beat up on these things to make sure you know how they fall over, when they fall over, what the failure conditions are like, because I can tell you from personal experience, and I suspect that a lot of people in the room share my sentiment, um, uh, there are organizations that will tell you that something is vulnerable or that it'll, uh, it's fragile or that it will break and they will tell you that they have never experienced that scenario and they refuse to test for it so they have no idea what they're in for. So it's like they're literally putting their head in the sand and saying don't end map this entire network because there's skating equipment on this network. And you say, well what happens if I do end map that network? And they say they don't know. And I'm like, well then how do you know bad things will happen? And they're like, well, well, it's SCADA. Okay. Well, what, but shouldn't we find out? No. Okay, you don't like learning. On to the next one, right? Like, all right, so we're going to do a quick triage example. Um, and this is going to be a really fun one. I'm sure you guys will love this. Uh, this is uh, an example of, you know, you are a security director or an IT director and you work at an organization. Let's call this a mining facility. Um, not a Bitcoin mining facility, like an actual, like in the dirt mining facility. Uh, you are informed that the company has bought this new device and they didn't tell you. Surprise. The business wants to go live with this device ASAP because they feel that making a big press showing of this device will improve the earnings figures for this quarter. Uh, it either manufactures explosives for a mining operation, controls a deep rock drilling machine, or manages the elevators and airflow operations for a deep mine. You're not sure which because the documentation is in Chinese. You begin researching the device and realize that it's running embedded Windows 7, is unpatched and vulnerable from everything, uh, vulnerable to everything from MS 08067 to MS 1710 and everything in between. The vendor says that they can't apply the patches because the patches interfere with solenoid actuation. It means that it's vulnerable to NSA eternal blue exploits, WannaCry and everything else involved with that whole family of stuff. Um, to receive instructions from its mothership, it needs to be accessible from the internet because the vendor reaches out to the device, not the other way around. What do you do? First you drink, really? Right? Really? Seriously? When we're done, meet me at the bar and I'll tell you about some of the mergers and acquisitions pen tests I've done. It's... Yeah, basically that. Um, so, triage example. Um, 
Ideally, not every exposed service is needed physically. It would take tools to do any damage to this thing. Um, it looks like it's got some built-in PLCs. They will probably have VNC exposed because, of course, they have VNC exposed. And occasionally, you notice that it phones home to the same, I, same three IP addresses. The documentation says, through very poor translation, that the yearly mandatory maintenance that they made you buy for this thing only has to happen in person. Uh, so you can't put it in an actual cave. It has to be serviceable. Uh, at a high level, this thing is massive. Um, it does things that are big and loud, and attacking it would mean either physically being present with the machine in person or over, over the network. So despite its staggeringly poor design, it's actually fairly manageable. Um, it's possible for viral infections to spread using this device, and it's possible that it could have some kind of catastrophic mechanical failure and hurt or kill somebody. Um, so if the device got ransomware, it would be very, very bad. Uh, it would be worse if it exploded, and even worse if an, an attacker were to gain access to it and make it explode when, say, your investors were touring the facility. Um, because of its poor configuration from the vendor, it will be forever vulnerable and unpatchable, and understanding this from day one is very important. Fortunately, because of the simplicity of its networking requirements, it doesn't need actual internet access, really, uh, maybe an HMI, and, and physically it doesn't need to be touched outside of its yearly maintenance cycle, so that's handy. Uh, Ideally, you know, all, being, all things being equal and you having an endless budget for this sort of thing, you'd build a room for this device which is capable of containing gross mechanical failures, physically isolating it, um, digitally isolating it so that it can only speak to exactly what it needs to and nothing else, wrapping everything with compensating controls, cameras, man traps, RFID, uh, 802.11x, switch port security, physical locking mechanisms on networking cables, disabling USB ports with epoxy if required. Um, uh, and at, some, if, if at that point, if somebody is even thinking about messing with this device, um, you're going to see failed network connections at network boundaries, and you're going to see people skulking around this thing on camera, and arguably that's the best place to be. Ideally, uh, you want to see uh, if people are rattling the doorknobs, and that's effectively the, 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 sort of the best place you can be. And if you can tell that people are rattling doorknobs, you're arguably in the best possible place. So. Uh, final thoughts. Do not let the press overtly tell you how you should feel about the news. You should be able to take your own temperature. Uh, don't trust appliances just because they're appliances and the vendor told you, like, thumbs up, yay, it's a cool thing. No, it's not. Run away. Uh, they're actually just computers, and in some cases, they're really terrible computers. Um, you don't actually have to be a wizard to stop the NSA or, at the very least, make their jobs quite a bit harder. Rob Joyce, the head of the NSA Tailored Access Operations team, got up on stage last year at Enigma, Enigma Conf, and he said flat out that full PCAPs are his worst enemy. Um, because they have to operate over TCP just like we do. Like they have no crazy magic sauce, like all their hacks that we've seen so far, TCP, they're regular, like they're just hacks. Just because they're NSA hacks doesn't mean that they're like crazy wizard hacks that you can't see or deal with. Um, unless of course you run a financial organization and you deal with swift bank transfers. In that case then you actually probably do have the NSA in your threat model. Um, I encourage you to think like a real bad guy for a moment. Uh, you'll be surprised at what you come up with. Um, I'm way ahead of time. Um, I have like... 23 minutes. Uh, I, yeah, I'm way ahead of time. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? No, nothing? Sure, thanks. No? Nobody threw a knife? Nothing? Really? Okay. Go for it. What would I say if I weren't, if I wasn't, what do you mean? I don't know. It took me some considerable amount of time to put the talk together, and I've given you all I have. <laughs> You're empty, but I want more. Well, um, any other questions? No? All right, no questions. I'll give you back 23 minutes of your life. Thank you very much. <laughs> what? What's up? So I don't, I don't have a list of books for you to read, but I have a list of like talks for you to watch on YouTube. Um, it, there, there are people that will, that will tell you like partially redacted incident response stories of like crazy shit they had to deal with like on blue team engagements. Um, any kind of, 
anytime the phone rings at two in the morning on a Sunday and it's like a CISO, usually that's going to make for an interesting story. And every one of those things comes out to like some weird config problem or some, somebody brought in a vulnerable laptop or there was some ACL they forgot about. or In almost every case, it's something that people overlooked. Right? It's because business has to happen. So when people are pressuring you to like, business has to happen, you have to make the business go, business, business, business. In a lot of cases, you have to forego doing things that you would ordinarily do if you had enough time to do all the things that you want to do. Uh, and in some of those cases, security tends to fall between the cracks. So you'll, you'll get really silly things like 16 foundry switches that are the core switching fabric of a financial organization that all went down at exactly the same time because there was a memory exhaustion bug wherein if you SSH'd into the switch, it caused a memory leak and every command you typed into the switch would cause more memory to be effectively permanently consumed until it was power cycled. And since the last time all the switches were rebooted, they were all rebooted at the same time because a patch was applied, um, there was an SSH-based uh, uh, configuration um, retrieval script that, that was written that would go to each switch and back up its config every night. Well, every time that SSH uh, connection happened, it would eke closer and closer to having um, uh, a, me a memory, basically an overflow, where all the RAM was consumed and the device ceased to work. So one by one, one day, at like four in the morning on a Sunday, the, the backup routine fires, and it SSHs into switch one, grabs the, grabs the uh, uh, config, the switch tips over. And SSHs into the next switch, grabs the config, the switch tips over. SSHs into the third, times 16 switches and their entire trading platform goes down. And people shit their pants and come screaming into the office on Sunday morning wondering, oh my god, oh my god, we're being attacked, what do we do, what do we do? And you get a question that says, I think we're getting attacked, here's the, here's the, um, Here's the, the circumstance. Here's what we found. Um, only all of our core 16 switches went down, but everything else seems completely unaffected. Um, uh, it, are we experiencing an attack? If an attacker is in your network, and the only thing they've done is take down your core switches, you have way, way, way bigger problems than you're down. Like, if they, if they, are, in your, if they are two miles deep up your butthole, and they know everything they need to know to be like, oh, all they need to do is take out these switches and they're going to have a really, really bad day. <laughs> yeah, you've got way bigger problems, right? Um, you've got that sort of thing. And then like other bizarre things like um, major social media network has uh, a verification function where you're considered uh, an extra special person because they give you some sort of image or some sort of indicator that you're better than everyone else, right? Um, People that are scammers want to get a hold of this thing because it gives fake accounts that they create to spread malware or adware credibility, and they will go to bizarre extreme lengths to get this little image. So what they do is they start spoofing caller ID and calling the office or calling the office of the social media network uh, to try to get a hold of the verification department, despite there is no verification department and start trying to work the phone tree and start trying to social engineer people out of who, what their names are and who their bosses are. So like, what? Um, uh, what's another, another fun one? Um, why is it that uh, people that connect to the corporate VPN can access port 3306 on production equipment? Like, what? There's no Bastion host? There's no, there's no, like security infrastructure, there's no, like wh why can somebody VPNing into the corporate office to gain access to the normal just desktops, why does that person have access to production equipment on the database port? More importantly, why, why, uh, why was that user able to uh, issue a MySQL dump command and, why, and, and, and like cause a production outage? So a lot of these problems are, when you, just, when you talk about them in that context, they're pretty straightforward, and you're like, wow, anybody would look at that and say, that's completely stupid. Why was that done? Well, in a, almost every single case, the reason it was done stupidly that way is because it was overlooked, because somebody pressured somebody else because of time, because of ship dates, because of project management, people saying that other, something else was more important. So in a lot of cases, it's just a matter of understanding what you need to do to make a thing hardened, and then communicating adequately to the people that will tell you, no, don't do that, do something else, that no, you actually need to do this thing because it's important. Or in a lot of other cases, it's just a matter of taking the time to sit down and think, 
what could possibly go wrong, which is, I should make a shirt, right? Well, yeah, that's an exhausting thing, and it does, you can go crazy into the weeds with it, but at the same time, it's like, it's, this is not an academic thing. This is literally like, I'm gonna put on my bad guy hat and just think, if I wanted to fuck up some shit, how much shit could I fuck up? Just as a thought exercise, right? Because in almost every case, the, the you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. When you look at these things after they have become incidents, you're like, well, this is totally simple. Why didn't anybody think of this? Well, they probably did, and somebody told them to think of something else. So in terms of like, there isn't like a lot of, there is, well, I'm, okay, put it this way. I'm sure that there is a gigantic corpus of academic data that you could go imbibe, like books and lectures and all sorts of stuff, but like the best way to deal with the stuff is to do it or to find people that have done it and buy them alcohol and make them tell you weird stories. Like, let people be your road cone, right? Like, everybody, everybody's gonna have some sort of bizarre story about how they have some weird incident response thing they dealt with. <laughs> this weekend, rum. <laughs> cool. Um, do I still have time? Sorry, that was like a lot of extra. So, did I? Ooh, I wow, holy shit, I still have like 15 minutes. Anybody else? Since I'm, I'm a soft target now, I guess? No? Yeah? Probably. Cool. Well, then I'll give you back 15. Oh, no, one more? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, the, this, this organization got stuck in that scenario because they abjectly refused to patch the switches. Like, every switch was HA paired. Like, every switch could, you could have upgraded one and then upgraded the next one, but they were like, no. Or, or they don't have a contract. Okay. They don't, so they can't get uh, no, the updates were there. They just refused to let anybody turn them off for any reason. Even when, even when there weren't trades happening, because trades don't happen at four in the morning on Sundays. Go ahead. How do you deal with customers that have certification requirements that delay patching? That's a tough one. How do you deal with customers that have certification requirements that delay patching? Um, For example, I've got a customer that has a certification process that runs about six months. Once you're done with that, they want to actually use the device without patching it because they have a certified patch. Is this certified? Get a new customer. Is this? <laughs> Oh, I'm time. Cool. Um, is this is the is the customer legally required to to have this um, certification system around their patches, or is it just their own policy? Yes. Oh, there's some sort of legal requisite. Yeah. That gets interesting. Is it medical? No. It's not medical. Okay. Well, catch. I, I need to make room for the next guy. So catch me at the bar. Okay. <laughs> it's 11 a.m. Catch me at the bar. Oh, my God. <laughs>